Hi, this is Mike Delp with the Relax Back UK show on UK Health Radio, your global real feel-good radio station. On the Relax Back UK show, we explore all kinds of health topics, so keep listening and enjoy the ride. Hi, and thank you for joining me, Mike Dilk, on the Relax Back UK show. First topic today is type 2 diabetes. Now, I, I speak with an MD, a behavioural scientist, and a sufferer. We cover a lot of ground from the expense of the condition to us all. But I can tell you in terms of the financial burden uh, yeah. borne by the NHS, it's about £300 every second is spent on type 2 diabetes. So billions wow. of pounds uh, a year. Then on to ways to deal with disease, the disease when it happens and why some patients might be less responsive to help than others and what can be done about that. Judgment and stigma are such a useless and actually counterproductive emotion that actually we should be trying to conduct conversations about this disease in a much more sure. positive way. Then we have inventor Gary Watts who's developed a device to help with yoga, posture and all kinds of things. So you can roll out over the back of it. But what makes it different to anything else is that you can use each three of the separate pieces. You can take them apart and then you can use each separate piece on its own. So please do stay tuned for a great show. Thank you. This show is cool. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. It used to be hard to find the world's most wonderful alcohol-free drinks. Not anymore. Whether it's a health thing, a lifestyle thing, or you're trying new things, make sure you save yourself from the guessing game of the supermarket shelves and shop with zerozilchzip.co.uk for the world's most carefully curated range of alcohol-free beers, wines, spirits, and more. Health Radio listeners can save 5% with the code HEALTH5. Visit zerozilchzip.co.uk or click our banner on the UK Health Radio website. Discover alcohol freedom with zero zilch zip. Because nothing's better. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The topic today is uh, diabetes, but uh, more specifically type 2 diabetes. And my guests are Dr. Ian Braithwaite. He's a, a medical doctor and CEO of Habitual Health. Uh, Sil Dr. Sylvia Vuma, she's a behavioral scientist. And, uh, and Mindy as well, who has type 2 diabetes. So first of all, uh, guys, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'd like to sort of, to start off with, kind of get right back to um, basics and ask probably uh, Dr. Braithwaite, uh, what the difference is between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Hmm. Well, that's a great question, first and foremost, uh, and morning. Um, so 90% of diabetes is actually type 2 diabetes, with the other 10% being made up from type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes is a condition that people normally develop towards the end of their teenage years, if not a little bit earlier. Um, and what happens is the cells that control insulin, which then control blood sugar, start to fail because the body starts attacking them. And it's something called an autoimmune condition. And so um, whereas type 2 diabetes typically presents later in life, and we know that type 2 diabetes is a more gradual um, disease onset. And so it starts with something called pre-diabetes, where blood sugars go up a little bit. And we know that the body becomes resistant to insulin, which again is that hormone that controls blood sugar. And then as you get towards type 2 diabetes, the liver and pancreas stop responding to insulin as well. And then the cells that control uh, that produce insulin and control blood sugar start to fail as well. So you can see that they're both very similarly related because they're all about blood sugar and it's all about controlling insulin, which controls blood sugar, but actually they're very different disease process access actually. So it can be very confusing. All right. Okay. We may all come to, back to that, but let's park it just now back to concentrating on type two. What, what are the numbers at the moment? How many people are actually getting this in the UK? 
Yeah. So we're coming up to about 5 million people now living with type 2 diabetes in the UK, which is an astonishing number. Um, it's about one in 14, soon to be one in 10 adults in the UK are living with type 2 diabetes. So it's an incredibly common condition. That's huge. And is it a worldwide problem or is it, does it tend to be a problem of the developed world, more developed world? Uh, rates vary depending on which country we're talking about, but it is absolutely a global problem. There are about 500 million people living with type 2 diabetes worldwide and, and it affects every country in the world, um, but more so towards um, developed countries or wow. at a higher uh, ratio. Just as part of the, the background here, let me ask, this question is probably a bit unfair, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Does anyone have any idea what this costs, you know, back to the UK, really? You know, what does it cost, you know, the NHS, days in lost work, and you know, anguish of patients and family? Um, I mean, hard to put a number on anguish, but I can tell you in terms of the financial burden uh, yeah. borne by the NHS, it's about £300 every second is spent on type 2 diabetes. So billions wow. of pounds uh, a year. Um, and it's it's trillion dollars a year worldwide as well. So it's an enormous cost. And the reason is that type 2 diabetes puts, puts patients at a much higher likelihood of having some of the most awful and also costly to treat uh, complications of the disease, such as heart attack stroke, heart failure, blindness, amputation, etc. And for example, there are about 104,000 uh, cases of heart failure that are attributed to type 2 diabetes each year. So it's, it's an, and that's in the UK, sorry. So it's an enormous problem. Okay. So, so this is a very serious thing. You know, this is not, oh, I've got type 2 diabetes, never mind. I'll just take a pill and crack on with life. It's like a gateway to all sorts of really very nasty things. Well, I think that's a really interesting kind of uh, point you just made there. And that, that's kind of how we had traditionally managed type 2 diabetes, right? You go and see your GP, they might uh, prescribe you uh, your first medication, it would probably be metformin, and then you kind of get on with life as it is. But I think as our understanding of the disease uh, has evolved, we realise that that's just simply not enough to, to help most people and actually even help patients into remission. Right. Which brings on to this whole whole uh, topic of of lifestyle being a big factor. Mm. Um, how does is it possible to sort of say, well, so much of type two diabetes is due to lifestyle, and this percentage is due to actually you're just kind of unlucky with your genes. Mm. <laughs> you know, you've been dealt a bad hand. Um, so it's it's a very it's very complex the development of type two diabetes, and there are. Uh, lots of different risk factors that play in so cultural familial food environment um, as you say genetic microbiome and then obviously behavioral plays a big part in that as well but i think the way we need to grow our understanding of it is uh, we have very little control over you know where we're born who we're born to what kind of life we lead actually we're all at the whims of chance really and actually the behavioral changes you can make after a diagnosis may not have been available to people before. They may not have had the opportunity, the knowledge, the, the time to be able to make those changes. And so rather than I think being more uh, blaming of patients and talking about the behavioral lead up to type 2 diabetes, I think that there's a much more empathetic, much kinder way of approaching uh, conversations post type 2 diabetes that aren't associated with the stigma around the disease. Sure, sure. And also, I, I kind of think that my, my impression is, all right, we can't do anything about our genes. You know, we're, we're stuck with that. But actually changing people's lifestyle and, and habits um, might be just as hard. I mean, people are pretty unpredictable, aren't they? And, you know, get, get, getting someone, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 56. You know, if I would suddenly have to change my ways, this would be an uphill struggle for me. And I, I, I suspect it's no mean feat uh, to get someone to change their habits. And that's kind of where you guys are coming in to, to help. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming we have a behavioral scientist with us. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mike. <clears throat> that's, again, a really interesting perspective to bring in and, and an important one. And I would say something we're seeing um, together with Habitual and, and the research that Habitual has conducted recently in terms of 
how um, people with type 2 diabetes are perceived in the media and by the general public and how they perceive their own narratives reflected back to them really gets to the heart of the challenge of changing behavior and I would say currently our, our kind of how we talk about it in society is very individualistic. So there's a lot of responsibility placed on the individual person to sort of do the right thing without having yeah. had the foundation, as Ian was talking about, to really um, take those actions and behavior change in a sustainable way and in, a, in an empathetic way is a much more community based um, endeavor. So I think what we're seeing is that, yes, it's difficult to change behavior, and especially if it exists in the context of any kind of like external expectation of someone to, let's say, quote unquote, be a better person, which I feel like is the underlying theme of a lot of behavior. Sure. Conversations. Well, I mean, so my, my impression is that actually sufferers don't get a lot of sympathy. And if they don't get a lot, a lot of sympathy, they might not get that much support from well family and friends and that kind of thing yes exactly the there isn't a lot of sympathy for people with type 2 diabetes and this is also what the recent research by habitual has shown and and other research as well so i think there's a really big opportunity here to just have a different kind of conversation around what is the role of behavior change or lifestyle change in type 2 diabetes and where is the um, kind of right kind of support that we can offer people who live with it? Sure. And so my my impression, what you guys are trying to do, uh, you're saying that it's not just diet, although that's a very important part of it. It's lifestyle changes. So can you give us a, some ideas, a, a list of the sort of things that you, you mean by that, things other than diet? Well, I think the... Um, th many different organizations talk about it in different ways the list of let's say lifestyle changes that we try to focus on from um, a very compassionate place of understanding uh, with the habitual team and the habitual approach is really centered on habit change so just regular patterns that you might have in in your daily life and finding ways that um, really align with who you see yourself as and who you want to become essentially. So we're taking it from an approach of pattern recognition rather than saying, okay, you need to change your diet and then you need to change your exercise. Of course, those are also part of the conversation, um, but we're trying to take a more comprehensive approach um, than that. Okay, well, maybe now's a good time to bring in Mindy because you, you are a type two sufferer or have been and have, well, tell me, what, where are you currently, Mindy? Have, have you kind of um, got type 2 diabetes? Have you, have you um, cured it? Morning, Mike. Um, no, I haven't cured it, unfortunately. Um, I've been type 2 diabetic for 15 years now, um, so I'm taking um, tablets daily. It's been a real struggle. I think um, one of the things that we all sort of touched on was the kind of the psychological aspect, and I think for me lifestyle change is the key but that sometimes is actually the hardest thing to unlock because I think behind that there's also so much going on for a person so for example for myself food has always been a comfort and um, it's always been my kind of like go-to thing so changing my diet has been like you know really difficult because it depending on you know how I'm feeling and um mm -hmm with the kind of struggles of life, et cetera. And I've been a carer for my mum for a couple of years and things just going on. So changing my relationship with food has, is actually the hardest thing. Um, and also support. I think when I was first diagnosed, it was very much, oh, you know, you're, you're quite young to have diabetes. And um, it was a bit more of a telling off as opposed to, right, okay, this is what you've got. This is how we can support you. Um, and after about the first year, I don't think I really had, apart from my supposedly annual reviews I didn't really have any support so it was all down to me which is a kind of like the old google and checking stuff for myself but um yeah it's difficult because although we talk about it more now there's still not as much empathy I wouldn't say we need sympathy because I think that makes it feel like you know oh, you know poor you but it isn't it's a case of empathy and understanding because you know like Ian said so many people are suffering with this and there's so many probably mm. undiagnosed as well 
Yeah. Um, but I think the key would be just, you know, being able to have the support and just knowing that it's readily available, but also that stigma, because as soon as I was diagnosed, I didn't tell people for a very long time. I was so embarrassed. Um, I felt like everyone was going to say, oh, you must be so lazy. You must eat so much. And all those kind of typical things that just kind of go around in your head. Um, so for a good few years, I, I probably just ignored it. If that sounds that sounds awful. Whereas if that kind of support and stigma support was and the stigma wasn't, I think it would have been easier for me to kind of open up and sure. be able to sort of, you know, ask for support and and discuss the issue and, and get better sooner. So I'm, so um, I'm you, not in remission. <laughs> do, do, yeah. do you feel that, you, you know, you're able to do that now and life is somewhat better? It's slightly better. Um, there's still, I'm still quite kind of careful of who I tell because it's, um, it still feels like they're just going to look at you because you do get this look of like, oh, as in it's almost like, oh, my God, they must be really, really, really unhealthy and really lazy. Mm which funny enough, I, I'm not really lazy. Um, so it's still difficult. And I think that especially over COVID probably there's been the lack of support from like the health services has been quite dismal. So um, it's just, yeah, I feel to be honest, I'll be honest, it's probably gone by the wayside a bit for the last few years. So I kind of feel like I need to refocus on, on prioritizing my health, but in a way I do feel like I'm left to my own devices to do that, which is um, not great. If you don't okay. find it, well, just, oh, can I just add on a point there? I, I, mm -hmm. I think we need incredibly brave um, for, for talking about it and being so open, which is so rare, as I said, but I think she's brought up such an important point there, which is around stigma around the disease, preventing access to care and support, which can be helpful or even transformative, right? So, so we hear it time and time again that people don't want to talk to their friends and family. They don't want to talk to their doctor. They don't want to go and access a blood test. They don't want to engage because of the stigma around the disease. And every what we know about type 2 diabetes is the earlier that we can get on top of it, the earlier that we can make change is so much more efficacious or effective, sorry, for the actual underlying disease process and actually kind of stopping either the development or even reaching remission. And so at every point, stigma is a harness holding people back from accessing the care that, that they need. And, and we, the, the whole point of our 5 million faces campaign is to really try and, and break that stigma and show that, show that actually this can happen to anyone. This can happen at any stage of your life. And judgment and stigma are such a useless and actually counterproductive emotion that actually we should be trying to conduct conversations about this disease in a much more sure. positive way well I, I i you know you're well on the way to doing that or you're you're certainly making a dent on on doing that but you know chatting on on programs uh, such as this so that you know that that's to be uh, lauded let me ask you one question though i i did actually i had a look at your um, your website, Habitual Health, and uh, it, it, very interesting. You know, it goes over the sorts of things we've been uh, chatting about. But one thing that you were talking at, that crops up there, talking about because uh, a lot of it does come to diet. Talking about diet and getting into remission. How many mm -hmm. people are actually successful if in getting type two diabetes into remission? Is it is it a realistic goal? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. So we know that the main determinant factor of, of the chance of reaching remission is, is how early we can help people to reach effective, clinically evidence-backed remission programs as soon as possible. So in a cohort of people that were diagnosed within three years, um, when they went through a remission program or a fast weight loss program, such as habitual, for example, we know that about 60% of people can enter remission. So it's a huge portion of people in the pre-diabetic phase. We know that actually it's, it's even easier and, and you only need, you need to lose a little bit uh, less weight to enter remission. Um, but we also still know that it's possible far into the disease as well, but those are more anecdotal supports rather than uh, supported by large scale randomized control trial. But essentially at whatever stage of the disease, you can make a significant progress with helping type two diabetes um, by engaging with effective uh, behavioral change and remission yeah. programs. And uh, when, it, when it comes to the diet again, do you find people can keep that going? Because I, I, I noticed that part of uh, the program on habitual health is actually supplying food mm. uh, because it has to be, you know, a controlled diet. But do people kind of get not addicted to it, but dependent on it almost and sort of lose the ability to think about 
what they're going to eat for themselves. I kind of actually... Has that been an issue? Uh, I don't think anyone's ever become dependent on it. Um, I would say that the what we do, the reason we provide food is because actually if we're going to take people through a very fast weight loss program, so trying to lose about 15 kilograms in about three months, the simplicity of having food delivered and everything um, provided for you is so beneficial in terms of both the speed of weight loss and the safety um, that we can provide with that, but also giving people the space with which to address the, the really complex uh, psychological, behavioral, social um, uh, uh, issues that they may also interplay with their relationship with not just diet, but also sleep and also physical activity. Um, and so it gives us a very fertile ground with which to make really significant behavioral change for people. Um, and we never really want people to be dependent on, on the food that we provide. Actually, what we want to do over the course of our program is actually really to imbue our patients with the skills and the habits, as Celia has talked about, um, to continue uh, on their own in the long term. We provide our app, we provide our support team for life for our patients. And we know that because everybody finds it hard in the long term, right? You know, we go through a stressful period in our life. Um, you know, Mindy talks about caring for a mum. You know, these things, these challenges that life put in front of us, which are out of our control, make it a lot harder. And we know that actually patients need ongoing daily support, which uh, you know, it's just not the provided in a health service at the moment when you just simply get an annual checkup and a blood test and a review of your medication. So uh, we're trying to show that there is a better, more proactive way to manage the condition. No, OK. And, and it, well, it sounds like you're doing it very successfully. And also, you know, in the long term, it's got to be good for everyone. Good for the people with type two diabetes, but good for everyone who's chipping into the NHS. Because as, as you said earlier, you know, it costs the NHS vast sums of money. So. Hmm. You know, this, this is great. Thank you for coming and uh, chatting ab about it. If people are listening to this and thinking, right, now's the time I need to do something about my type 2 diabetes or I'm worried about it, what have you, um, what is a good resource for them to have a look at? I'm sure you have a, a, a website. Yes, they, they can absolutely uh, use our website, which is tryhabitual.com. Um, but there's tons of other ways to engage with us as well. We often find that people want to think a lot about it. They want to be at the right stage of their life. So remember, there is support by going to talk to a doctor. There are other great websites out there, Diabetes UK. Obviously, tryhabitual.com has tons of amazing resources as well. But also one of the things that we're also doing for, for Diabetes Week, which is this week, is, as I said, trying to raise awareness of the um, the... The, how widespread this problem is and how many people it affects and how different the people who live with diabetes are. Um, and so we're doing a campaign called 5 million faces. So if there are any uh, people living with type two diabetes out there, feel free to go on our website. There's a little banner at the top um, and you can upload a selfie. Um, our wonderful illustrator will do a little illustration for you and we'll send it back to you and we'll put it on the website. And the aim is to really just to show the world that there are so many people living with the disease and, and maybe try and break some of the stereotypes that exist around uh, people who live with type 2 diabetes. Good, right, that sounds like a, a very worthwhile plan. So uh, Ian, Sylvia and Mindy, thank you very much indeed for chatting. Thank you, Mike, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. This show is cool. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. It used to be hard to find the world's most wonderful alcohol-free drinks. Not anymore. Whether it's a health thing, a lifestyle thing, or you're trying new things, make sure you save yourself from the guessing game of the supermarket shelves and shop with zerozilchzip.co.uk for the world's most carefully curated range of alcohol-free beers, wines, spirits, and more. Health Radio listeners can save 5% with the code HEALTH5. Visit zerozilchzip.co.uk .co.uk or click our banner on the UK Health Radio website. Discover alcohol freedom with zero zilch zip because nothing's better. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. Next up, it's Gary Watts of East Knoll. Gary's a very interesting guy. He's done loads of things and he's an inventor. 
and he's recently developed something called the Yo Back. See if you can spot my uh, my little uh, mistake when introducing him. In fact, he's created something called the Yo Board. So, um, Gary, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to chat today. It's the Yo Back. <laughs> the Yo Back. Look, I told I, look, I told you I wasn't very good at interviewing, didn't I? Good start. I like it. Yeah, the Yo Back. Now I should know because I've tried it out. But I, yeah. I better give the listeners a bit of a background. I, I, I met Gary at, uh, at one of these exhibitions. It was called Elevate. And Elevate, I think, kind of is for anyone that has anything to do with gyms and uh, workout and stuff like that. So I, I walked past uh, Gary's stand and um, I think there was someone lying on the floor when I, I went by, which sort of made me look twice. And uh, he's created something which we will talk about. Um, to help people with like yoga or if, if people have got bad backs and that sort of thing. And it's called the yo back, not the yo board. All right. So first, first question, Gary, which is probably a bit unfair, but I'll ask it anyway. Are, are you one of these inventor blokes that can't go more than a couple of days without an idea of a good invention? Oh, I wish I could say I was Elon Musk, but not quite. Not quite. This is my first and only invention, although it has most definitely evolved from what its original purpose was. Yeah. So it's the now, now that it started, you know, that's how the train starts leaving, leaving the station. Once it started, your brain's like, oh, what can I do now? What can I do now? Right. So well, so, so can, you, can you give it like a, a, a potted version of the process? No, actually, before you do give, tell us the process of inventing this thing, tell us, kind of, give us a, a summary of what it is and what it, what it can do for me. All right. So, essentially, the, the tagline that we're going for is, uh, you know, the wheel has been around for thousands of years and everybody always says you shouldn't reinvent the wheel. And I thought, well, it's been around forever and it's never changed, so we should reinvent it. So, essentially, the Yobak is a wheel that's in three separate pieces that slot together so you can use the full wheel for like full body stretching so you can roll out over the back of it but what makes it different to anything else is that you can use each three of the separate pieces you can take them apart and then you can use each separate piece on its own so you can use those separate pieces for a, a, a ton of different things so you can use that for um uh, yoga you can use that for stretching out your lower back stretching out your neck you can use it for posture support so right now on the back of my chair it's kept helping me to keep my spine up straight because we spend so much time sitting at a desk um, you can use it for calf raises and squats and mobility uh, it's just so many different ways that it can be used and it's just evolved from this very small idea that I drew on a napkin in 2019 to then being a, a big trade show in the XL arena. So it's been, it's, right. been a, it's been an interesting time. Yeah, very, very exciting. Okay, so the, the idea evolved from a sketch on a napkin, right? What, what yeah. happened next then? What happened the next day? Did you sign well, up? So, so, <laughs> so essentially what happened was I was on a train uh, in, I was traveling in Sri Lanka 2019 and we were traveling for about six hours and we didn't realize it at the time but it was Sri Lankan Independence Day so the train was absolutely rammed there was so many people in the country at one point I was actually hanging off the uh, out the door to be able to stretch my body so I had to stand up for six hours and I got off the train and I was like, you know, I wish there was something that I could like, I wish there was something in my backpack that I could have with me right now that would help me get rid of my back pain. Because there's nothing, I'm not going to go around with like a thera gun or, or foam roll because foam rollers are massive or wheel or pull up bar or anything like this. So it kind of just, that would just set the seed. And I just kind of thought about it. And then yeah, about three weeks later, this light bulb just came out. Well, why don't we just have a wheel that you can roll out your spine, 
but it's in three pieces. And I'm like, well, actually, it was four pieces originally. And I, I got went to the bar. Can I have a can I have a beer and a napkin? Got one beer and a napkin. Drew it out, and then we got it. We got it three D printed, and it was dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> it was dreadful. It weighed about four kilos. It was enormous. And we said, well, we could probably do a bit better than that. And then we ended up doing, I think, about 10 different prototypes over two years until, until, we, until, until we finally perfected it last year. Right. And so the perfected model, what is it made from? So it's made from um, ABS and a little bit of glass fiber what sorry what's abs abs plastic okay abs plastic and glass fiber um but it's super strong we had it crushed and it broke at 500 and something pounds it was 252 kilos um and then the top of it is a cork mat so um the reason we went for a cork mat is one a few reasons one it's sustainable two it's antibacterial so it can it's easy to clean and three it's actually more it's actually more grippy it's grippier than a plastic mat so if anybody listening does yoga they might have a, a cork mat and they'll know that the more that they sweat it's actually grippier right so if if you're doing press ups or you're doing uh, calf raises or squats or or you're just using it in the morning rolling out on it it actually grips to your back a lot more okay so that's the reason why we went for a, for cork and also i can imagine if if you if you're doing uh like a a back roll on it it feels warm on your back some of these yeah, things it does. feel cold and you kind of hunch up yeah it does it, it it really does it does feel quite nice um and i need to check into it and maybe your listeners might know better but someone was telling me that it has there are some healing benefits to using cork, apparently. I'm not sure if that's scientifically proven, but I'd have to check it up. But when I was actually at Elevate, yeah, someone said that there's some, some healing benefits to, to using cork on your body rather than using plastic. Okay, I, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I, no I, idea. I, I, can't, I can't comment. can't comment, Gary. <laughs> All right, so... So, but have you have you done yoga yourself? Are you are you a kind of a, a yogi type? Well, it depends what you say. Have I done? I've been doing yoga now for about seven years. Uh, I did my yoga teacher training, two hundred hours, um, last year. Was it last year? You know, with with the pandemic, you kind of you kind of forget what year it was, right? Don't you? Mm. Like, was that last year? Yeah, I think it was last year. Um, but I'm still terrible. <laughs> That's why. It's not like my, my partner. So that that doesn't doing... sound like a, a, a great advert for the teaching thing you went on, the teaching course you went on. Well, you know, the thing was, actually, the teaching, the teaching was, a, was amazing because it didn't, I didn't become a teacher because of it, but it, it, it developed my understanding of how to do yoga and how to get in the poses correctly because I didn't realize when you're doing yoga about how much of it is hip alignment and understanding where your feet go and, and internal external rotations. And once you get that understanding and breath work, once you get that understanding, which is what I got from my 200 hours, my own practice itself, uh, it, 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 it exponentially went much, much, much better. Right. So I, I would, I mean, I mean, I would highly recommend yoga. I mean, just to go off on a little bit of a tangent, um, I'm a very, very injured individual. Uh, my body is slightly broken, which is one of the reasons why I invented the yoga back. Um, and I was getting uh, weekly sports massages. And the guy I was getting a massage from, he said, you need to do yoga. You're so tight and so inflexible. You need to do yoga. Right. And I remember when I was in school, I did the, um, it's like a sit and reach test. So you basically put your feet on a box and then they'll get a ruler and you try and touch your toes and they see how far either away from your toes or past your toes are. And I'll never forget it because I was a 30 centimeter ruler away from my toes when I was like 16. And that's <laughs> just from years of running on a road and playing football. Right. So, 
So is, is it playing football that kind of and... damaged your body? Yes, yes, absolutely. I um as as a as a winger, you just get kicked constantly. You just you just get kicked. I mean, I was a long distance runner, so running on roads and that probably hasn't helped, but mainly just playing football and just getting kicked constantly and landing awkwardly. I've broken a few bones, I've dislocated my elbow, I've sprained my ankle more times than I can count. Um and once I and my back I hurt my back when I was about 12 and I was going to a chiropractor regularly and doing yoga brought that down to going to a chiropractor very, very rarely. And a funny, funny story is actually my chiropractor, he called me up after I invented the yoga back and I was using the yoga back every day. He actually called me up. To say, hey, Gary, how are you doing? Uh, I haven't seen you for a while. Is everything OK? And I said, yeah, 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 it's great, actually. Um, I've got I invented this product and it's been really helping me. And he said, oh, yeah, what's that? Come in and bring it in. And he said, oh, great. Can I sell that in my clinic? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So let I'm going to interrupt you here because this kind of leads on very nicely. I'm talking about the Yovac. Um, I, I wanted to ask what physiotherapists and chiropractors and the like uh, think of it in some ways you've answered the question already but what have you found what have you discovered so yesterday yesterday actually I spent the day filming um with a physiotherapist phys using so uh different ways to use it and whatever so after Elevate I actually went straight to another festival called Balance Festival and that was in Shoreditch it was straight afterwards so that was six days Six days of standing up, try, try, trying, to, trying to get people to use it. And he was one of the first people that came in. And straight away, he was like, oh, I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. And he showed me a load of different ways. So he bought one the first day. And then he came back on the last day and said, I've got one for the clinic, but I need one for my house. Right. So he got one for his house. And then he sent me an email and he said, you know, on our Instagram, uh, we do loads of uh, filming and I think the product's great and I want to do a whole series on, on it. And can you come and introduce yourself and show us some ways to use it? So I went to Bermondsey yesterday. So it's Hito Physiotherapy. And we went there yesterday and we spent the day filming and he was showing me different ways to use it. And he was saying that he uses it almost every morning himself. And he's going on holiday to Mexico and he wants to bring at least like one or two of the pieces with him on holiday, which is exactly why I, I created it. So that you can mm -hmm. take it anywhere you want. So like he's really on board. Um, as I said, my, my, my chiropractor is going to hopefully sell it in his clinic soon. Um, we've had uh, yoga teachers uh, have, have really liked it. Pilates teachers have really liked it. And uh, yeah, so it's the feedback has been, it's so humbling to be honest, Mike. Uh, I'm just a guy that made something to help my own back pain and, and, and stiffness. And then I have a physio saying, oh yeah, I use that every day. You know, I really want, I really want to do this. I, I, I think it's a great product. I want to put this on my Instagram and, and show people how it can help them. Like it's, it's, it's mind boggling to me that I can just make something that, 400 people have, have are, are super happy about it, it's, it's it's incredible yeah no it, i mean it, it's fantastic although you say just made something it, it was you know <laughs> yeah I, i'm sure that glosses over the fact that actually it was quite hard work you know you said there were ha, ha, how many prototypes did you say so yeah so we did about 10 prototypes and then we did a kickstarter last year so we did a Kickstarter last year, November to December, where we raised enough money. We sold about 350, where we raised 22,000 pounds. And that gave us enough money to do the mold. Because that's what costs the money with these kind of things is, is getting the initial mold. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And then it took a bit of a delay because of the pandemic and, and China closing down. Um, but we got those out to the customers in May and June. 
and it's been nothing but excellent feedback so far and then yeah obviously then I did the Elevate show and that, I think Elevate for me it was such a great experience it was such a great experience to just get it out because you have this idea and then all you can do is show it to your friends and especially with the pandemic so you can't travel too far mm-hmm. you can just show it to your friends and they go oh yeah it's great mate it's great it's really cool can I get one and you go well yeah you should get one but, the, but they are your friends They're my friends <laughs> but, you know and then they, they actually, might not say yeah sorry Gary you know this, this ain't gonna hack it <laughs> yeah right right real friends wouldn't maybe they're not maybe not maybe they're not real friends and um so yeah so but to get it out in front of people like yourself and to just see people's opinions like just hearing this all day oh <laughs> <sighs> just hearing that all day you're just like wow i, I made that <laughs> how does that happen i i want to i want to ask you a technical question something that i've I've been wondering so this uh circle is it's made into three pieces so you can take them apart and put it back mm-hmm. together again what joins them so it must be quite a robust kind of method of the whole lot clicking together well not so much it started off more complicated than it needed to be and then we ended up, I mean, we used three different engineers to get to this point. Um, it started off with four pieces and then it wasn't strong enough because you had like the joints directly above each other or below each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's just an angled joint and the tolerance, which, so the gap basically is super thin. We're only talking a millimeter or two. Uh, so then it just slots together and then, it, then, then we have a couple of locks that lock it in place so it doesn't slide out. Right. So it started off, we were thinking about getting, um, uh, we were having one of our prototypes was metal, was like a metal tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that broke and it was too heavy because the whole idea is that you can take it with you. The whole idea is if you're going to work, like right now I'm sitting in my sister's house and I'm using it on my chair and I'm using it on my feet. And I just traveled three weeks of Europe and I carried it with me the whole three weeks and it wasn't a burden. So you couldn't have anything that was too heavy. So a lot of our joints became too clunky or too complicated. And now it's essentially like a jigsaw puzzle. You just slot it in, click right. the locks. And it so did you come place. up with that design or did you buy some help in? Yeah, so we, 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 we got a... Um, we kind of got most of the way there and then we hired an engineer from Greece to help us develop it a little bit further. And then once we got to there and then um, it's manufactured in China and we found a a sourcing agent. Uh, It's an American company based out in China and they had their own engineer. And then we kind of just, tweaked it a little bit, tweaked it a little bit, tweaked it a little bit. Um, that's why we did so many prototypes. And then we were like, okay, we've, we've got it. We, we, we finally got it. And it's just like an angled joint, basically, so that it distributes the weight nicely. Right. So look, if, if, if people are listening to this, Gary, and they're thinking, all right, this sounds kind of interesting. I would like to like, ha- have a look at it or, poss- or try it out essentially get one um how where are they available at the minute so at the moment they are only available on our website which is eastnoll.com that's another story we can go into if you like east no is east like north south east west and then noll n-o-l-e so eastnoll.com or if you just go into google and you type in the yo back which is y-o-b-a-c-k all right uh, and it will go to our website. Um, I've got a little discount code for any of your listeners. Oh yeah, so yeah, given that. If you, so if you go in and you go to and you put in the discount code "relax back," that will give you fifteen pounds off. Um, it's free shipping, for, uh, forty-eight hours free shipping. It has a thirty-day money-back guarantee. So the idea is, we wanted to make something that is going to help you. And we're so confident that it's going to help you, that you can take it, try out for 30 days. If you don't like it, you just send it straight back. Uh, It's got an ebook, 
that comes with it that's got about 60 different ways to use it so far. Uh, links to a YouTube channel, which we're currently building. And we're trying to get some physiotherapists on board and chiropractors on board and yoga teachers, Pilates teachers to eventually build up a huge library so that when you get it, you, you've got so many different ways. And we're asking people that have already bought it to tell us how they use it. So that's another interesting thing was I didn't really use it on my chair too much. But so many people messaged us and said, it's great. I use it at the office. Right. I use it. I use it on my back. And I, and then I was like, oh, I never really thought about that. So then I started putting it on my chair. I was like, oh, it's amazing. That feels great. You know, that, that's, I sit at work all day. That feels great. And that, that, that specifically came from one backer from the Kickstarter that said he uses it like that. And I tried it. So it's like an ongoing process. Okay, brilliant. Well, it it sounds like the thing is sort of is moving forward. People are using it and liking it. You just hinted at something else. You said there's a whole other story there. The name of your company, East Null. Tell that story quickly. Yeah. So, so the idea, the two names, the the, the company name is East Null. So um, I actually live in Vietnam, and my girlfriend is Korean. So East Knoll is, everyone always says, well, that's a weird name. So East Knoll is because we, we lived in Southeast Asia. And then Knoll is, is a Korean word. So sometimes they don't have, like, direct, like, they don't have direct translation. So the idea is, uh, so Knoll is the glow of the sunrise or the sunset, like the, the glow of the sky, mm-hmm. of the sunrise or the sunset. So the, the idea is, well, if you get the yo back, it's the start of a new day. Okay. All right. I, I can see that. I think that works very nicely. Yeah. And then the, the name, the yo back became, uh, because we want to relax yo back or fix yo back. Okay. All right. No, very nice. Good luck. It sounds great. You've talked about it beautifully. I wish you a lot of luck. I just want to remind readers of the discount code, relax back. You put that into the the website, and the website is what's the website again? So it's eastnole.com, e a s t n o l e dot com. Or if you just go into Google search or Bing search, and you just type in yo back, y o b a c k, you get it. All right, look, Gary, thank you very much indeed for chatting. Uh, Thanks a lot, Mike. uh, It's great to meet you at Elevate. Thank you very much to my guests on this week's show, and they were Dr. Ian Braithwaite, MD and CEO of Habitual Health, Dr. Cecilia Vuma, behavioural scientist, and Mindy, she's a patient with type 2 diabetes. And lastly, it was Gary Watts of East Knoll. And then, of course, thank you to you for listening. That was the Relax Back UK show with me, Mike Dill. Thank you for listening, and please do join us again next time. Thank you.